I would make sure that you're interviewing every single one of the contractors, sitting down with them, getting to know them ahead of time, and then asking them to give you a presentation. Welcome to Passive Income Pilots, where pilots upgrade their money. This is the definitive source for personal finance and investment tactics for aviators. We interview world-renowned experts and share these lessons with the flying community. So if you're ready for practical knowledge and insights, let's roll. Welcome back to Passive Income Pilots, everyone. I'm your host once again, Tate Durier. I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Ryan Gibson. What's going on, my man? How you been this week? I've been great. And how, how's the flying going? I've been flying a lot lately, which has been a challenge, as as you're well aware. You you don't fly as much as me, um, but uh, that's all right. We're we're fortunate to have enough people and systems in place that the business sort of uh, keeps ticking away uh, as I'm busy flying, and I'm really looking forward to pulling back on it. You know, uh, yeah, you know what, that's we- sort of that's sort of what we've been. We're kind of teaching our our listener base is how to invest your way out of your flying job if you want to right and i'm a i'm a living working case of that so i've got the uh i've got the passive income now and i'm working on uh waiting for the next vacancy bid so that i can pull back on a little bit more nice I, well i had fun i i took the cirrus up uh the sr22t my there favorite plane and uh so friday mornings i do a hike with my friends in seattle every friday morning get up super early get out there hike and come back well this week we did something really fun. We jumped in the airplane. We actually flew to the San Juan Islands, to Orcas Island. We hiked in the morning to, to the top of Mount Constitution, got the courtesy car, went and got pastries, jumped back into the plane and flew back. And I was back in the office by 9 a.m. So That's really so had a cool. <laughs> normally like a seven hour drive, but I did it in like 30 minutes in the plane. It was it was a lot of fun. And you'll be proud of me. How many of you guys went? Two. What's that? How many of you guys went? A uh, total of four of us. Nice. Yeah. And on the way back, I had to pick up an IFR and, and shoot the Arnav uh, Zulu into Renton. So I was, nice. uh, I was, I was working it. I was working it. So there we go. Oh. <laughs> well, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Excellent. Well, today we have a very special guest. This is actually someone on the Spartan team. And uh, we at Turbine are currently um, diligencing a ground up development deal. Very excited to potentially be bringing this to our investor group very, very soon. Uh, but this is a fund that Spartan has directly open to everyone right now. Um, in any case, Aaron Saunders, Spartan Construction Management. He's the president of Spartan Construction Management. And can you tell us a little bit about Spartan Construction Management? Because this is a, a separate company, right? Yeah, so uh, many years ago, Spartan uh, actually started doing its own construction. So we started, uh, we wanted to start our own construction division and build out an entire team from uh, doing the estimating, project management, execution of all of our ground up construction because we do it all over the country. And so, like the SCM, so we started a separate company called Spartan Construction Management. And this is our construction company SCM, now. Right. Yeah, and we brought in a super experienced, very good uh, leader, Aaron Saunders, who's now our president of the Free Ups or the uh, Spartan Construction Management, and he basically oversees a team of about ten or so folks, and they're licensed in over seven states, and they've even got it up uh, producing for other people too. So we actually build not only for all the Spartan projects, but they build externally for other self storage people that are looking to have their self storage facilities uh, developed. So. Um, I thought this was a really cool episode because I feel like if you are looking at vetting a ground up construction deal, there's a lot that goes into like the due diligence and everything that happens before you actually buy the property and you want to make sure what you're investing in has gone through the proper risk mitigation before your money goes into that deal. And we cover that on this episode. And then Aaron walks us through like how he finds subs in these different markets, building remote, how he vets the subcontractors how he manages the project, manages risk all the way through the deal. So I, I, this is just such an interesting episode. If you're ever wondering how commercial construction actually works, we even at the end talk about what kind of contract we use. We share the exact contract, the AIA agreement that we go through and talk about. Mm-hmm. One thing yep. Aaron mentions kind of like off the cuff a lot is he constantly refers to the A. 
H J, and that's the authority having jurisdiction, which is just speak for the city that oversees the the, the project. So if you hear him say that a lot, that, that's what that is. Excellent. Well, I was uh, actually not able to attend this interview, so I'm excited to listen to it myself. Um, but if you look at the range of syndication deals, development typically is on the high right hand side of the graph in terms of risk reward, right? It's got the best risk risk uh, reward, um, the highest risk, the highest reward. But if you're doing it right, it uh, it you can reduce that risk, mitigate that risk. And honestly, right now with the way real estate is going, where prices are extremely high, it's difficult to buy things. We're seeing that ground up development is actually a really good play because if you can't find it at a good price to buy it and everything's really expensive, you know, instead of buying an overpriced multifamily or self-storage facility to do a value add on, why not just build it from the ground up? So excited to get into this episode. Let's get uh, to you and Aaron. So Aaron, welcome to the show. Really excited to have you. How are you doing today? Doing great, Ryan. Thank you for having me on the show. We're excited to get uh, get started. Yeah. So um, Aaron is our president of construction at Spartan Construction Management. And uh, it's really fun working with Aaron and his team because I get to see uh, some of the work that they do and, and it, building things is really exciting. So Aaron, I know that we're getting started on a new build. We're building about 550 units or about 75,000 square feet in Bellevue, Florida. And we are just about to purchase the land. I think we're planning on buying the land maybe this month or, or early next. Um, and one, one of the things that we do to mitigate risk in construction is we get all the entitlements and permits done before we purchase on the property. Can you kind of talk to us about what that means and what your team has been working on to do that? Yeah. So along with the development team with Inside Spartan Investment Group, our team has been partnering with them to engage our architects and engineers to make sure that, like you said, the project is fully entitled and we're permit ready before we close on the project. So it, it minimizes a lot of risk for the investors on those projects where we can spend a little bit of money up front to make sure that the project is 100% go instead of buying all the land, getting committed early on, and then the deal falling through or not being able to get permits and not being able to build. So Working with the development team, we're able to structure those buyouts or the purchase of that land um, to protect the project and protect the investors. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that there's a cost that goes into entitling the property before we purchase it. How, how, how much is that cost typically? It, you know, it really depends on the project and the complexity of the project. So, you know, if we're doing a multi-story facility or like this facility that's a single story, we're going to spend less than $100,000 on getting our architect, civil engineer, uh, all the preliminary permit review costs and all of that squared away. Um, but when we're buying a facility, just the dirt, one and a half million dollars or so, spending that $100,000 to make sure that we are permit ready and the project's ready to break ground as soon as we close on it minimizes a lot of that risk. Yeah. So, and for listeners, this is about a four and a half acre site. We're building about 75,000 square, square feet or about 550 units in, in a city called Bellevue, Florida, which is just north of the villages, which is a growing population area. And, you know, the things that we're doing in, in this economy to kind of mitigate risk is we're actually negotiating with the, with the seller of the property to allow us to have uh, full entitlements before we begin. Mm -hmm. Um, I should probably take a step back and and ask you, you know, what does that really mean? What what what, do, what does having full entitlements mean on a, on a on a parcel? And when does that risk really get satisfied, in your opinion? Yeah, yeah. So full entitlements on a, a property means that it's zoned correctly, and we're allowed to build self storage, or you're allowed to build whatever you're you're trying to build on that piece of property. So. The majority of property around the country is not zoned for self-storage. Uh, and we go through, uh, the Spartan investment team goes through and identifies pieces of property that they would like to build on based on the demographics, not based on the zoning. We just look for properties that were already zoned for self-storage. Well, anybody can do that. But when we bring the whole team in, we're targeting properties that, that are specific to where we want to build that facility where there's a new housing development. There's a lot of population moving in. You know, there's not a lot of storage in that area currently. And we go in and we'll work with the, the city or the municipality 
or the AHJ, the authority having jurisdiction, and we will get that rezoned to allow self-storage. Now that process can be fairly arduous, which is a good thing for us because it eliminates a lot of our competition. Um, if no one else is willing to go through that tough process to get it entitled, and we are, then that just gives us a leg up in the community. Uh, and that's what we're doing on properties uh, around the Southeast currently, specifically this, this Bellevue project being one of them. Yeah, that's really important to note, you know, because the storage demand might not already be, the storage demand might not be where the storage zoning is, right? So you, ha you exactly. have to go to where the demand is yep. to get the correct, that's a really good point um, that, you know, I think a lot of listeners may not may not realize is that, well, you know, you bring a project to somebody that's zoned for self storage and meets checks all the boxes for building, but may not all check all the boxes for having enough demand to build the site. That's exactly. great. Yeah. So I understand that we're we're finishing up the entitlements. I think we've uh, re we've done some zoning work. I guess we've annexed the property, one of the parcels into the city. Um, to kind of get it ready for uh, the entitlement process. Can you kind of, can you, what, what does that mean? When, when I say, you know, we annexed a property into, uh, into the city or into the, the, the other parcel, well, can you kind of walk, walk me through what we did there? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of times we'll find parcels that are in, in the county. They're not incorporated in the city. They're unincorporated. Um, and there's pluses and minuses to that. So typically you'll have a little lower taxes on that property, but you don't get the benefit of all the utilities and services that the city provides. Sometimes when you go to um, entitle a project, the local city is going to require you to annex into the city so that you can use the fire resources and water and sewer and all the resources that the city has put in as they continue to build out their infrastructure. So annexing into the city is basically where they're going to redraw the city lines around your property, pull that property into the city limits. Um, it does increase the property taxes a little bit, but again, it provides all the services that are provided by that city. And sometimes there isn't an option to do that. So we make sure that when we're going through the underwriting process and our feasibility team is really digging into each one of these parcels, that we're including those costs in the development process. That's great. And so my understanding is one parcel of this land, this, this property comes with two parcels that makes up about four and a half acres. So one, one of those parcels was actually in the city and the other one was not. So we had to kind of scoop it and move it over. How hard was that process? Yeah, um, the, the city of Bellevue is actually great to work with. So it's been pretty easy. Uh, we actually partnered up with a civil engineer who's working on a car wash right next door to us. So he had just gone through this process and, and he's a longtime resident of the city as well. So he knew a lot of people, and I think that's part of it is it's really about the team that you build around the project and making sure that you have a civil engineer that's local, that knows the process, and that knows the soil and the requirements there. But um, really just putting the team together to work through that process, um, submit all your applications, meet with the city, talk through uh, what that process looks like, because every city and municipality is a little bit different. So they may have their own process, an additional review meeting or a board hearing or city council review. And, and taking that project through that process. Again, Bellevue was fairly easy, fairly straightforward. And we're, I don't wanna say we're on the glide path, but we're pretty close. And nice. uh, yeah, we're gonna be breaking ground there in hopefully about uh, four to six weeks. Yeah, that's great. So you're, you're in Colorado, your team is in Colorado at our golden office. Yep. So for this, you mentioned all these meetings, right? To get this uh, property uh, rezoned, re-annexed, whatever it might be. Are they flying to all these meetings and, and attending all these meetings in person in Florida? It's a combination. So when we first met with the team or the um, the city down there, Garrett from our development team went down there and he met with them in person because he really wanted to have that face to face interaction. So they knew who he was, not a you know faceless developer on the other side of the country. Really sure. start to build that relationship, and that's important. Um, but since we have our civil engineer local, he's all, also been attending some of those meetings. So. It's really a combination of both of our team and our team on the ground meeting in person. That's great. Let's let's talk about the civil engineer. So how yeah. did you identify him and how do you kind of vet your civil engineers to know that you've got a good person to work with in the local jurisdiction? Yeah, a lot of it is referrals. Um, so when we first went to walk the site, we identified, hey, there's a car wash clearly under construction right next to us. Let's find out who's working on that project and and start to interview them and we'll ask around the city we'll ask around you know, other contractors around the city um, 
and we'll call them and we'll just, you know, start to take them through that pre-qualification process. And we do that for all of our subcontractors across the country because we're working in so many different states and so many different local communities. Not all of our subcontractors can travel. Not all of our civil engineers have that local knowledge or our architects have that local knowledge of the process. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll take our subcontractors through a, a pre-qualification process, whether that's, uh, you know, a, a civil construction company or they're putting in concrete or they're putting the buildings up or they're a local electrician or like in this case, a civil engineer. So, so essentially you kind of do some detective work. You know, Absolutely. you go to a market and it's like, who's doing the, jo- the jobs around here? Who's, who's actually interacting with the city already? Who's got all these relationships? Who knows the local code really well? And in this case, it was really nice that they, you had a brand new car wash coming in next door and you just sort of worked it backwards and figured out who was the leadership in sort of that development. And um, would, would you say a, the civil engineer is kind of like your quarterback in all of this? I mean, they really are kind of running the plays, at least in the beginning of the of the project. They are. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything starts with the civil engineer on site. So everything from getting the geotech out there and doing your survey figuring out the topography, understanding where your detention ponds are going to need, be needed if they are uh, required, what what curb cuts or entrances to the road. Those are all the things that the city or the municipality is going to want to know about to take this project through. Our architectural renderings are great, right? Because they can see what the elevations look like and how pretty the building's going to be. But they really want to get into the details and know, uh, is your building set off the property lines correctly? Um, or is there a detention pond and is it large enough to um, to meet the requirements of the property? You know, where are your fire lines, where are your fire hydrants, all of the things that the city requires and what they want to see all come from that civil engineer. Okay, so he's helped us with the annexation of the lot. And I, my understanding is that that's been sort of chucked off and, and approved. What's next? What 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 uh, what part of the what do we work on next and, and how do we get the project to the next stage? Yeah, so uh, right now we're in the land disturbance permit approval process right now, and then we're going to be submitting for building permits. And both of those processes are fairly quick because we've been communicating with the um, the municipality so far, and we're we're getting pretty close on both of those items. Um, On the construction side, what we're doing actually starting next week, we're kicking off our um, our superintendent on the project. So he's actually going to be flying up to the office in Golden and doing a transition with our pre-construction team. So he'll sit down and do a full page turn. So page by page, they'll walk through the whole scope of the project. Every every drawing that we have from our building suppliers to our civil engineers, our structural concrete foundations. Uh, and he'll look at how all of those parts and pieces tie together and do a constructability review. Um, he may point out little things here and there that we want to tweak with our drawings. Um, nothing that's going to change our building permits, but just how we want to build the facility. And then, yeah, he'll team up with the the pre-con team and really start calling all of those subcontractors locally. And the superintendent, so the, the you talk about the quarterback, is the civil engineer. As we transition over to the project and project execution and start building the job, now that superintendent on site becomes the quarterback. And that superintendent and, is a Spartan uh construction management employee, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. correct. So um, the Spartan construction management team has myself, we do the full pre-construction uh, process with, with the pre-construction team, and then we have our project execution team as well. And that's our director of operations, our project managers, and all of our superintendents who are boots on the ground during the projects. And yeah, so while they're on the ground, they're coordinating all those subs, they're meeting with the city, Um, They're working with surveyors to come in to verify setbacks and lot lines. Um, But yeah, they're the quarterback on site. So they really, they own that process once we go to the site and they're coordinating all those subcontractors. So having them engaged in that pre-qualification process to say, you know, yes, I'm comfortable with this subcontractor coming out here and we'll be able to work together pretty well. Uh, He'll, he'll manage that whole process. So heavily that's engaged great. in that selection of those those subs. That's great. So let's go back to the property, right? We have this four and a half acre site. Get your civil engineer out there. Civil engineer works with all the local codes to make sure that 
we can walk the property through its paces and get it and get it built. One of the parcels has to be annexed into the city. What what other, you know, kind of talk, you mentioned something you said a geotech and some of the things in a survey. What so th- that's kind of like a an, a a good study of what the property is, what's going on with the property below the surface, where are the exact boundaries? Can you kind of talk to sort of those types of details like everything that we know about the land now and how we learn those things? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We kind of take it for granted, I guess, after doing it for so many years and so many reps. But yeah, when you look at a, a piece of land, you don't know exactly where the boundaries are, right? Your neighbor may have had a fence that's encroaching on your property, or there may be additional water lines, or there may be an easement through your property, which an easement gives someone else access rights through the middle of your property. And it's typically displayed on uh, county records or, or city records. But that's why we do a survey. So we'll have a, a surveying company come out and they're going to mark on a drawing exactly where those property lines are. They're also going to stake those property lines on the property so we can visually see out there where those lines are. They're also going to do an investigation on any zoning requirements, what your neighbor, neighbor zoning is, um, and if there are any easements on the property. They will will also request a topography as part of that, which gives us elevation lines of the property so we can clearly see what the elevation is of the properties just surrounding us, as well as the topography of the site that we're working on. And that really helps the civil engineer know, all right, we're high on this side of the site, we're low on this side of the site, we want our drainage to flow from the high side to the low side. How can we set up our buildings to make sure that we achieve you know, the best drainage, natural drainage, without having to pump any water or put in any storm drain if possible. Um, and then, yeah, taking all of that that information, we talked about the geotech report, that's the next thing that the civil engineer is going to look at because if we are using a detention pond on site to retain some of that water, can't just let all the water flow into our neighbor's property. That's not being a good neighbor and they, they typically don't allow that. Right. <laughs> um, but They'll take that geotech report and they'll understand, well, where is the groundwater level? Um, And that geotech report, let me back up a little bit. What they're going to do is they're going to come out and they're going to take borings. So they're going to bore into the soil and they're going to take those cores of soil back to their lab. and They're going to analyze what's the makeup of that soil. Is it sandy soil? Is there rock under there? Did we hit bedrock, you know, two feet below the surface? Uh, how much organic materials on the top of the site that we need to clear off because we can't put buildings on top of. How many borings were on this site? Uh, you remember? I'm I'll trying to remember. Here. I think we had roughly eight. We had to get one more done because we relocated the detention pond and they really yeah. wanted to know where, um, what the soil makeup was under the detention pond uh, to make sure that we had enough uh, flow and that water would percolate. I yeah, was- so I mean, for for the audience, right? Uh, we have a lot of pilots that listen in, and a lot of pilots are list- are are familiar with the the term a heavy check. And a heavy check is when every once in a while you take the airplane to the hangar and you completely just strip it all apart. You take every single nut, bolt, <laughs> piece of piece of the airplane off to study all the um, rods and pulleys for wear and tear, mm-hmm. and you know you really look for structural issues and things like that. It sounds like when we buy this property, we basically put it through a heavy check. Uh, you know, I mean, we're boring holes into the soil. Those holes go down, what, like 10 to 14 feet, something like that. Yeah. Sometimes deeper, depending on the site. Yeah. So we're really going to have an understanding of, of this property before we start pushing dirt on it. And, and that geotechnical study, um, really does that. Um, what about environmentally? Is there anything that we look at uh, to make sure that this wasn't like an old gas station or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's actually one of the first things that we do. So as soon as we get a property under contract, we will we'll engage an environmental um, study on it. So they'll do an environmental phase one. And basically that's just a, a computer check, right? They're going to run all the backgrounds to see if there have been any environmental claims against the property, any spills on the property that are currently in remediation or have been remediated. Uh, if there are neighboring properties around us, hey, there was a um, laundromat right next door uphill, and that's going to flag an environmental issue. Um, yeah, not, plumes, not right? That that's the case here, but um, yeah. So we've seen that on some of the properties that we've done due diligence on around the country where, oh yeah, there's a laundromat across the street or a gas station across the street that was now 
um, you know, decommissioned, but there were multiple claims about spills on that property adjacent to yours. Well, now we may have an environmental issue on our property. On this property, it was, it was clean. There were no issues. So yes, there is a new car wash going in next to us, but the land, that land was, um, was raw land prior to that. Behind us is a small housing development. And then um, on the other side of us is just this little industrial warehouse. So, yep. Pretty Very clean. Good. So, so that's, that's called environmental phase one, where they just kind of, like you said, they just sort of check the yep. box, make sure there's nothing wrong and, and ops check good. Or, or you know, they, they found that there was nothing wrong with the property. So what, what, what would happen, though, if they found something with what would be the next step in the process? Like if they let's OK, so let's say there was a spill there, you know, 15 years ago. Uh, that they found in the first phase one. Yeah. So when they do their environmental phase one report, they're going to recommend a phase two. And that phase two report is going to give, or the recommendation is going to give pretty clear guidance around what needs to be done in that phase two. We'll engage a, another consultant to come out. And now we're actually going to the specific site. We're doing some analysis. So we're going to test some of that soil. They may take a boring in one of those locations, similar to the geotech. Again, they're going to take that back to their lab and they're going to analyze that to say, yes, the remediation was completely done. The site's clean. You're good to go. And they're going to issue us like a clean bill of health. And we can use that for our lender, for our insurance company, um, and just for our own peace of mind on the property. Now, if that comes back and it's not clean, now there may be additional remediation that needs to be done. And that may be the recommendation from the phase two is that, yes, this part of the property is clean. But this area where they had the spill, they didn't completely remediate the property. There's no longer an obligation from that previous owner to remediate that. And now if we want to buy the property, that liability is on us. And I say liability. Liability can be managed multiple different ways. But it's hiring the right team to come out there, remediate that area. We'd excavate all of that contaminated soil off the site, remove it off site, and pay to have it disposed of. And that would give us a clean bill of health going forward. And that's called an environmental phase three, correct? Oh, sorry. That is phase three. Yeah. Yeah. Two, yeah, is, no just, two is the uh, on-site inspection. Yeah. So phase right. one, just kind of checking it. It, it. Ops checks good. We can move on. Or basically you said phase two, which would be something that comes out of phase one saying, hey, there was, there was a spill here a few years ago. We, we recommend that you do a phase two and maybe send some soil samples to like a lab or something like that. Sure. And then if they're clean, you can be let go. Ops check's good there. Yep. Or you could be recommended to actually have to clean up the site again, which is a phase three. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So you've covered a lot of ground here, right? So you've got a survey that checks for easements, setbacks, restrictions, things that might uh, prohibit you from building in a certain area of the property. Um, you, you've talked about the environmental side where you know, is this a clean site? Is this not a clean site is essentially the, the gist of that. Um, and then you have the geotech where they're actually putting, you know, they're digging into the soils, you know, as much as 10 feet, 20 feet could be, could be more, could be less. And now you have all these reports and you are basically getting a clean bill of health on the property. This is all of the stuff <laughs> and the annexation and the permits and the plans and all that. This is all happening before our investors are actually being introduced to any risk. So when you're evaluating an investment, and again, I, you know, this is, this is what we do at Spartan. This is not what every developer does, but we've, we've mitigated all of this risk before we actually commit to buying the, mm -hmm. the, the property. And um, I think it's very important to understand when you're investing in development, there's entitlement risk. And, I, and I, entitlement, you know, I, I it might have a better definition, but I kind of view it as all the stuff we just talked about, right? Like the whole property is been inspected and ready to move forward uh, to start building on. And, and then you sort of have building permit risk. And so talk, to, talk about that, right? So we've done all these inspections. We got the site laid out and everything. Talk about the building permits now, because because that doesn't all the stuff that we just did didn't give us the right to build anything. It just it just kind of checked the site for for buildability, right? Where we 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 we've got a good parcel to build on. Um, talk about the building permit risk, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so, so I guess two things. So once we do get it zoned correctly, now we are entitled to build self storage, but 
the building permits determine what it's going to look like, the size of it, and that can really fluctuate the costs on the project. So that's the process that we're going through now is getting those building permits and making sure that that the municipality is good with the elevations and the colors and the glazing that we have to do or the signage that's going to be on the building. Um, is it going to be one story, two story? Do we have to shield any of our air conditioning units? Uh, a lot of municipalities don't want those visible from any roadway. So you may have to change the, the building a little bit to, to make sure that they're hidden. Uh, are there fencing or screening requirements? All of those things go into the building permits. So yeah, so when we talk about minimizing that risk, it's taking that process of really being as transparent and communicate communicative as possible with the AHJ and the community there so that they know exactly what we're going to build all along the way so that we don't tell them, hey, we're going to build this big, huge, beautiful building that looks like an office building. And then we get get to submit our building permits and it's a single story you know, drive up that may not be exactly what they had in their mind. So we're trying to communicate that all along the way so that we don't get to the end. And then they tell us, oh, well, we'd really like to have this or we'd like to have this. And all those like to haves or want to haves that we get from the the building department, those things cost the project money. And yeah, we're trying well, to minimize that um, those cost impacts. Well, and, and it's not like you're just flying without a manual, right? You you know, in the in aviation, we were subject to the federal aviation regulations, Part ninety one for our general aviation flyers, right? Part one twenty one for our commercial airline pilots that are flying passenger jets. And, and they're basically the rules of the road. It's what we can do, what our constraints, what our exceptions are to things. Um, the same thing applies in, in construction, right? We have the International Building Code. And so a lot of the plans are sort of built off the International Building Code, the IBC. And then there's some local requirements, right? Can you kind of speak to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And every municipality is a little bit different, um, but they do have their local requirements. And that may be, you know, in order to do self storage or outdoor parking, there are screening requirements. There's so much requirement for landscaping based off square footage of your facility. So many parking spot requirements. And our architect and civil engineer are going to work through those together to make sure that when we, are, we submit those plans the first time, that we've checked all of those boxes. Now, sometimes there's some wants and asks and things here, and we may try to ask for a little bit of leniency or a waiver on one specific area uh, or one specific item or maybe a couple items, depending on the, the site. If the restrictions from city to city may may impact the buildability or um, the feasibility of the project. You know, if they require a huge amount of parking spaces for the office that we can't use to rent out and store vehicles on or RVs on, um, that may impact the size of the building, which impacts rentable square feet, which impacts the returns, and that may not allow the project to pencil. So we mask, may ask for a variance on that specific item to say, you know, we're going to have an office, but we'll typically only have two or three people there at the at peak, um, plus the manager that's there. You know, we don't need 15 or 20 parking spots. That's a good um, point. Now, now, when you're we're talking about risk, you know, if you buy property, and you find out after you buy it, by the way, we're paying $1.4 million for this parcel, these two parcels, I should say. And, you know, if you if you bought that land and then found out, you know, did your environmental after you bought it and found that it was a spill site and the property's worthless or that it's going to be unattainable to actually pay the money to remediate, <laughs> right? It's going to kill the project. Yeah. Uh, that would be really bad. So I think if you're an investor looking for due diligence, right, whether it be passive or active, please make sure you understand, you know, where the property's at in this. The, th the stuff that Aaron, not, not you're talking about and the building permit stuff, we're also not buying the property until those uh, building permits are in place. W when you're comparing the risk between sort of that first phase of due diligence and checking the boxes to the... Uh, building permit phase. Now, I understand every every city is a little bit different, but you know, on a on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, let's just do it this way. <laughs> what what would you say the risk in the first phase is versus the building permit phase? I mean, the you know, 1 being low risk and 10 being the the highest risk. Yeah, I, I guess there's a couple different ways to look at it. If if we were talking about buying a piece of property without doing any due diligence at all, your <laughs> risk is 11. Like don't <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
um, if we're looking at uh, entitlements and zoning and getting it, it rezoned, your your risk is a little bit lower, but you still have to do your research. You need to figure out, you know, is the community open to rezoning properties? How many properties have they rezoned lately? Have they denied any rezoning applications in the recent past with the current um, city council? And understanding what their, you know, what's their temperature for development? Do they like development or do they not like development? And and depending on all those things, your risk may be seven or eight, you know, in that range before it's entitled. Now, once you get it entitled and you start taking it through that design process, now your risk is down in the, you know, maybe two or three range. It's very unlikely that some someone from the city is going to come in and require or demand something that's going to kill the project. Um, it may impact the cost or the return slightly. If we have to do some facade improvements or some additional screening, or things above and beyond uh, what their code says. But again, if their code and the city code requires one specific thing and they're asking for things above and beyond that, we're gonna challenge that. We're not just gonna say, oh, you want you want that? You want a big mural on the side? Well, that's great, but that's not for us to pay for and it's not required for the development process or to get permits. So we're gonna challenge those things and we're gonna make sure that we're building um, you know, nice, beautiful buildings that achieve the returns that we're expecting for our investors but we're not going above and beyond with a bunch of wish list items. And a lot of cities will try to get things for free. That's, you know, it's just part of the process. That's, you know, I'm so glad you brought that up because there's a difference between an ask of the city and a requirement of the city. Correct. And we've, we've built in areas where there is sort of that artistic requirement, you know, that, you know, specifically we've been in jurisdictions where there's design review and, Mm -hmm. and, the city has, you know, community comprehensive plans that say, you know, the property kind of has to look and feel like everything else that's being built in that community, or it's got to have a certain vintage or architectural features, or, you know, maybe a shed roof and windows. And, you know, it's got to have certain architectural elements. Can you kind of walk walk us through that and, and, and maybe specifically how it was at, at Bellevue so far? Yeah, Bellevue has been pretty good. Um, we haven't had a lot of architectural requirements there. Um, we've actually made a couple of changes there just on our own, really just to attract some more customers and really to let everyone know that, hey, this is a self-storage facility and it's, you know, a nice, new, clean, brand new facility and it looks attractive. You know, when we talk about self-storage facilities, we want them to be clean and safe, right? And well lit. And if my wife is going to go to the self-storage facility to get something out of the unit at seven o'clock at night, when it's dark out, I want her to feel safe. If she doesn't feel safe, that's not a property that we're going to. Um, you know, but we talk about architectural improvements. We did a project in Oregon recently that we wrapped up uh, last year, and the architectural improvements were were pretty heavy there. There was a, a statue that needed to go out front. You know, quite a bit of of <laughs> extra work that had to go to the facade of the building and. We've had customers drive by and go, oh, I didn't even know this was a self-storage facility. Well, yeah, I think the city wanted to follow their style. They have their own design requirements. So all the buildings do have you know, their own specific design requirements, and it looks kind of like a nice, quaint little mountain town. It's hard to make a self-storage facility look like a self-storage facility and uh, a cabin in the woods at the same time. Yeah, and, and for the listeners here, we'll put that in the show notes. Uh, the property he's talking about that he built last year was our free up storage uh, Sandy uh, location in Oregon, which it does look like, I don't know, it looks like office buildings or something. You pull in and <laughs> it's got the nice lodge uh, facade on it. Um, we couldn't actually put any of our brand colors on it. It had to be a certain color. So we couldn't put our color doors, our color buildings or, you know, things like that. There's restrictions on what signage you can put on the building. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's very, uh, uh, restrictive, you know, from, from the city's standpoint, because they want their town to look a certain way. And, and in this case, that town is like on the way to Mount Hood. So the town is kind of going for that, like stop for a sandwich and a cup of coffee, kind of cute mountain town look. And and our self-storage facility certainly wasn't going to be the exception to that. So Aaron, can you build these in any city? I mean, can we talk about, you know, just transitioning to like moratoriums and uh, restrictions and why maybe jurisdictions don't want self storage facilities in a, in, a, in a current market or a specific yeah. market. Yeah, I, I think that plays right into Sandy. So uh, 
we were the one of the last, or I guess the last permitted project in that city is what we were told from the city. So when we picked those permits up, they said, this is the last self-storage permit that we're going to issue. Um, and we're not going to build any more self-storage in our town. And I think that goes back decades into what self-storage used to be, um, where it was, you know, a couple of single story metal buildings, uh, not fenced, not protected. There was crime, there was theft. And I think that still kind of resonates in the back of, of a lot of these municipalities or, or people's minds. And that's not what self-storage is today. Self-storage is a retail use. Um, it's close. It's down the street from my house. It's down the street from your house. It's in every community around the country because people need that, that little bit of extra space to store things that they can't store at their house or at their apartment or their condo or wherever they're at. Or if they go to vacation at the beach, they want to keep all their beach stuff, you know, on their way to where, wherever they're going, uh, to the place that they're, they're renting. So, you know, it's kind of, I see both sides of it, right? A lot of these these municipalities don't want it, but it's our job to really talk them through what the current use is and and what their their residents, their constituents are really expecting and what they need in those communities. So sometimes it is a little bit of a challenge and a little bit of a sale, and we have to get up there and talk them through that, look, this is what the national demand is uh, for self-storage. This is what your current supply is in your market, and your constituents are currently being underserved in this asset class. And they need additional self-storage so that they can have that surge bandwidth for, for, for their own storage needs. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. And like in, in the case of Sandy, I mean, they've, they've artificially cut off any additional supply, mm -hmm. which is only going to impact pricing, right? So on one hand, right. it's great for us. On the other hand, it's not as great for the citizens that are going to probably be limited to the availability of storage, which is only going to increase the price, right? If you don't that's have true. demand. If you don't have the supply coming into the market, you're not going to be able to uh, have competition to to bring down pricing. So, you know, these cities, these cities that don't want it, that's great. I understand. But certainly, you know, there is a need because self-storage is based on life events. And so yeah. that's going to have an impact on pricing and, and really just cost your citizens more money. Exactly. Yeah, um, that's interesting. So, you know, kind of... Uh, Jumping back into Bellevue, okay, so we've got the land inspected and we're working on uh, permits and things like that. Assuming the, the um, you know, you've got an understanding of what the cost, you know, is of the, of, the, of the site to build it, you know, we project that to our investors now. We say, hey, you know, we're carrying a $80 a square foot budget for this particular project. And I believe we have a 10% contingency, which is another about $8 a square foot. That could have changed. Talk about how can we even come up with an estimated budget for something like that now when you when we haven't really had a chance to build the plan set and and then how that might evolve throughout the course of the project yeah yeah so we get plugged in pretty early with the feasibility team and our development team and they're going to give us uh when they first get the property under contract or even prior to that they're gonna they're gonna reach out to us and say all right we've got this site it's roughly four and a half acres um we think we can build this much square footage kind of an estimate at the time, not quite a napkin sketch, but a little bit better than a napkin sketch. We're going to take that information, all the information that we know about the site, and we're going to do a conceptual estimate. So uh, we're going to try to break down that price per square footage for what our building costs, what our foundations costs, what our typical site work costs, cost for fire water and electrical and HVAC and all the different trades that go into building one of these facilities. We're going to put that conceptual estimate together and we're going to carry a little contingency on that as well because, well, at that point, we're going to carry a little bit more contingency um, just because there are a lot of things that we don't know. Um, and that's kind of step one. They're going to take that number back to their feasibility report. They're going to run it through and they're going to say, all right, based on this information, the project's a go. The next step, we'll continue to go through the design and, and refine that price as we get better and better and better. It's a challenge to go out to get pricing from an electrician or an HVAC subcontractor or a civil contractor. They don't know what you're building. So they're going to need design plans from our engineers to give us a firm price on that. But we have a lot of historical knowledge uh, and historical pricing from all the projects that we're, we've done. So we're using that historical pricing to give us a ballpark uh, on these specific projects. Uh, and then we'll transition from that conceptual estimate into 
uh, a more detailed estimate. And then once we get the final final permitted drawings, we're going out to all of our subcontractors for hard bids and lock in their pricing. And once we lock in their pricing and execute those contracts, now we're reducing our contingency and we've locked that price in. Yeah, so that's really it's really interesting because you know you can't really you know you have to put on your contractor hat here for a minute, and I'll put on my investment group hat for a second, right? You can't really commit anything uh, in stone on a project until you have full set of drawings, exactly. right? It's 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 impossible for anybody out there to. You know, and I think this is why, like, for, for listeners that maybe are working with a contractor at their house, you know, it's like guy comes over and renovates your house. And, you know, it's it's hard because you may or may not have a plan set and you may or may not have a hard bid based on, you know, line items in a plan set for your house. Maybe you do. OK, that that's not it's, it might be a, a case here. But when you're doing a big construction job like this, you're you're taking broad brush strokes in the beginning and and you're sort of refining, like you were saying, until you get that plan set. But once you get the plan set and you get hard bids from the subcontractors and and, ascent, and effectively from your contractor, they're sort of it's legally binding might not be a, a, a the word here, but it's sort of locked in and there's an agreement that takes place by and between the investment group and the contractor that sort of guarantees that pricing to an extent, you know, and I believe this is a guaranteed max price bid. And so some people might think, okay, well then I'm guaranteed that it's going to cost this. Um, but there's exceptions to that, right? There's things that may still cost the investment group or the investor uh, more construction cost, and there's some liability likewise on you to make sure that that pricing is locked in, right? So Correct. can you kind of can you kind of dissect that a little bit and uh, maybe talk about the instrument, the legal instrument that we use to uh, to hold each other accountable? Yeah, yeah. So we have a master service agreement with Spartan Investment Group, and that really pencils out all the. It's all the legal language throughout the project on what we're responsible for and what Spartan Investment Group is responsible for. And then we also contract, we use standard AIA forms, which are construction contracts for all of our subcontracts across the country. And that's a standard form that, that we use um, so that we're consistent on all of our projects and we're reducing our liability by locking that pricing in, requiring that our contractors are insured we're, we're protecting ourselves through indemnity agreements and ensuring that we're not going to be liable for any consequential damages or anything like that on the project. And it really just goes through um, all of the different sections of a, a contract to make sure that we're, we're protecting ourselves as well as the investors. Now, yeah, and, uh, and Aaron threw out this word AIA. So when you think about residential, you may just be flying off a contract with your contractor that the contractor provides, something that you downloaded off the internet, <laughs> something that you found at a local uh, RIA group. But in commercial and in some residential development too, we use a standard form contract and it's called AIA. And that's the American Institute of Architects <laughs> uh, contract. And it's basically a standard form contract. And okay. there is, uh, there's different versions of the AIA contract. You can go online and type in AIA, uh, I think it's 101, 102. I don't know all the, all the yeah. numbers off the top of my head, but, but basically they have different meanings and they have different carve outs that hold the relationship. Like there's a standard relationship that's been thought through, you know, so that, the, the, that there's a legal, there's more of a, a set in stone legally binding agreement. It's not just like subject to interpretation. So think about it. if you grab some random contract off the internet, who, who knows how that's held up in, in court? Who knows how that's held up in mediation or, or whatever it might be? The AIA agreement um, is very purposeful and has been thought through and approved by the Association of Architects. And usually that brings in a relationship between the architect, contractor, and the owner of the project. Um, and who's, uh, who's going to make the call on a change order or, or things <laughs> like that. So... Um, speaking of speaking of change orders, change orders are are, are common, 
And, you know, some, some people might pride themselves on not having any change orders, but <laughs> I think change, change orders are just a reality in commercial construction because, you know, at least speaking from experience uh, on one project that we did a years ago, it's like you had different fire hydrants or different water valves mm -hmm. or whatever. And, you know, you, you only, you know, maybe the architect writes up those plans and says, I think there's going to be, you know, 10, uh, four foot uh, fire hydrants or whatever it might be. And really you get on site and the existing conditions are completely different. And the contractor bid what the architect put in the plans. But once you got to the site, the site wasn't what the architect inspected or expected. And now you need six foot fire hydrants and that's going to cost more. So who pays that cost? Well, the, you know, it's not the contractor's fault that the architect put the wrong thing in the plans. So that would be the obligation of the investment shop. Can you kind of talk through the kind of just some of those things that, you know, maybe you're responsible for versus the investment group or the investor? Yeah. yeah. So once we get that full set of drawings and we execute our contract with, with the owner, so we're doing work outside of Spartan for other uh, developers as well. Um, and we have that same contract with Spartan that we do have with others. And when we get that set of drawings, just like you said, we're bidding that specific set of drawings. We can't know things that you don't know or things that aren't told to us. So I think it's a challenge for a contractor uh, in some of these situations where uh, the owner may say, oh, well, you should have known that. Well, I can't tell what's under the dirt that you own here. So, yes, we had a geotech report done. Um, and we did a utility locate, but they didn't identify this unmarked gas line that crossed over the property. And I, there's no possible way that I could have known that that gas line was there or that you could have known that that gas line was there. But I shouldn't have that, um, that liability on me to know unforeseen circumstances. Yeah, yeah, so, makes sense. But when you talk about what I am responsible for is that if it's in those drawings and I send it to my subcontractor, my subcontractor tells me that, that he or she has it in their scope and they're going to execute that scope of work, or maybe they, they don't. They exclude it from their contract and I miss it and don't pick it up with another contractor. That's on me. Now, I'm responsible and I own that risk, uh, risk of any liability or any cost to find someone else to execute that scope of work. So if it's in those drawings or it's outlined in the scope of work as a responsibility for me to do, that's on me. I own that uh, and I need to manage that. So making sure that your contract with your subcontractor or with your general contractor includes a superintendent on site. So we have supervision on site and they're coordinating all the subcontractors and that you're, they're doing schedule updates and they're keeping the site secure. They're carrying their own insurance on the project. So builders risk, make sure that the buildings don't get damaged in a windstorm or a hailstorm or a tornado or, or whatever it is. Um, carrying, uh, you know, general liability policies and making sure that if someone's car runs into the building after it's built, that that's protected. And all of those things are covered uh, as well yeah. as making sure all the drawings are listed and included in that contract too. No, and that's good. And I think the point Aaron's trying to make here is, you know, if you go out, let's say you're, going out and quoting, getting a, a self-storage built, you know, let's say you're the, you're the developer and you, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to have Aaron put in a bid for me, SCM put in a bid for me to do, to build my site. And you go to like three or four other contractors. The lesson here is that, uh, you know, if there's, you know, four, four contractors bidding on your site, they should all be within 5% of each other. Pretty Would, close pretty close or maybe maybe 10 and Aaron you can correct me here as I go along if there's somebody who's 20 percent cheaper than everybody else that's a red flag that's a red flag <laughs> and and the re and, it, <laughs> and it's not that that person you know people think well you know maybe that that's a local guy and he's cheaper and he's got less overhead and okay maybe but that usually means that that contractor hasn't put something in their bid. And you're going to find out about it halfway through the project that, oh, I didn't bid. I didn't have that scoped out in the project or, yeah, exactly. you know, and, and, and I think that was probably the biggest lesson that I learned, you know, developing early on was, you know, what, well, why is this guy 20% cheaper? And then you, you start digging through their scope of work and you, and you realize that they didn't put any allocation to maybe hauling off, you know, 
five thousand. You know, one. You know, the the civil engineer recommends ten thousand feet of dirt. You know, coming off, and he's only carried twenty five hundred, right? And so you, you're going to pay that, and and it's going to be your responsibility, and it's going to be a change order, right? Because the contractor is going to say, hey, I've, I'm allocated you know twenty five hundred yards of cutoff of the site. And we all know it's going to be ten thousand, <laughs> so he's not cheaper, right? It's just he's not paying attention or listening to what the plan set is saying. So, you know, if you are going to have multiple contractors bid a bid a project, uh, just they should they should come in about all the same uh, for commercial development. I'm not speaking about residential and things like that because I think there's a lot more variables in residential, like availability of contractors, and you know, I think. I think contractors can come in and just, you know, kind of put their hand up and say, you know, that bathroom's a hundred grand, you know, and, and it's a hundred grand because I'm too busy. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And, and so when you get into commercial, you know, you'll find that. And in most of these contractors, Aaron, are, are basically going and finding kind of the same subs, right? I mean, they're finding. Yes. Yeah. The sub base should be fairly similar. So if we're going into an area, we're going to find, you know, three plumbing contractors and we're going to bid those three. We're going to use the best price out of those three. But again, those three should all be fairly close as well. And if they're not, then one of them probably missed something. Um, and it flows all the way uphill. So like you said, when you get a when you get three or four bids back from your general contractors and you just go to the pricing page and look at the prices, that's one indicator of where risks are. But then you really need to dig into your clarifications, any of your exceptions and make sure that they didn't exclude any scope of work that you're expecting them to do. Yeah, I sent them this whole bid package and asked them to bid the whole thing, but they put an exception in there that, oh, we're not gonna do any frontage improvements or we don't do any landscaping or whatever it is. And their price is a lot less. You go with them and like you said, then you start digging into the scope of work after the issue you know, boils to the surface and you realize, oh, they excluded these three scopes of work. I thought I was getting deal on the contract and now I still have to get that done and go find someone else to execute it. So finding a contractor that's going to provide a complete bid and covers that full scope of work is is very important. Yeah, I, I can't stress that enough. I mean, I, it is tempting to go to the bottom line and try to find, you know, the cost that you've always dreamed of. <laughs> but <Yeah>. the reality <laughs> the reality is is you want you want to find the contractor that's that's you know, is thoughtful, is is gone through and, and has looked at your plan set and is going to deliver what you want them to deliver. And as the investment shop, you've got to make sure that you understand what you want your contractor to do and that they've bid all the things to do it. And you just have to accept reality that these things cost money and and you've got to carry the appropriate budget. So Aaron, I'll, I'll um, you know, as we get to the end here, I, I want to be respectful of your time and appreciate you coming on and, and talking about yeah. us all this stuff. Um, so okay, so you get four bids and they're all about the same. So who, what contractor do you pick? How do you how do you make that selection? You know what makes what makes the different what makes the horse? You know because basically you're picking a horse here. Um, you know yeah. so how do you kind of pick your horse? Yeah, so there's obviously there's a lot of things that go into it. I would make sure that you're interviewing every single one of the contractors, sitting down with them, getting to know them ahead of time, and then asking them to give you a presentation. I want you to give me a presentation on how you're going to build this project and a why you presentation. So get up there, tell me about who you are, where you came from, what your values are, and you know what does your team look like? Who's going to be the superintendent on the project? I'd like to see that superintendent as part of that presentation, and that superintendent should know that project in depth um, so that they can really tell you that, you know, we identify these as a couple of risks. We identify these as a couple opportunities, but this is how we're going to mitigate the risks and this is how we're going to take advantage of the opportunities, whether that's schedule or material availability or subcontractors or, or weather impacts, whatever it is. But really get to know that general contractor before you before you select one. And then, you know, what technologies are they using? How are they going to communicate? Are they going to mm -hmm. give you weekly OACs, which is a, a owner, architect, and contractor meeting? And what what goes into that OAC meeting? Um, what does the agenda typically look like? We use Procore, which is a pretty robust or probably the most robust construction management technology platform. And our superintendents that are on our job sites every day take photos of the site. They record what the weather is. They record what subcontractors were on site, what work got completed, and any risks that came up that day. And any one of our owners can log into Procore at any time 
and see exactly what's going on on the site and look at that daily report. They can also log in and look at the full budget and you know what's changed in the budget. Have there been any change orders that have been, have been submitted? And they're not logging in to see those because we're communicating that in our OACs on a weekly basis. But how are they going to manage the job? Are they actually going to have a superintendent on site full time? Or, oh, we've got a job down the street, so the superintendent's going to cover both projects. Well, if there's an issue on the other site, that superintendent's not going to be on my job site. Um, so making sure that you have that uh, site supervision um, and subcontractor selection, and do they have a relationship in the in, in the neighborhood in the in the market? Have they built a presence there? Um, there's a lot of things that go into it, but at the end of the day, you need to feel really comfortable with them because it's multiple millions of dollars that you're putting with this general contractor and kind of putting the project, your baby that you've been working on for you know sometimes years in their hands to execute. And, and build this thing and turn, you're expecting they're going to turn the keys over to you and um, just making sure you're engaged in that process, um, not just in the selection of your general contractor, but heavily engaged throughout the life cycle of that project and, and engaged in the progress and asking questions, uh, making site visits, uh, not being an absent owner and just, you know, being a part of the project all the way through so that when you get to the end and you get those keys, you're getting exactly what you wanted. Yeah. And I, I think one thing that you mentioned, the OAC, I forgot to talk about that and kind of the project management throughout um, OAC owner architect contractor. That's a meeting that happens weekly. And you should expect this in your commercial job where we Spartan get on the phone, you know, the investment shop gets on the phone with the construction company and we're all communicating about um, requests for information, um, any change orders, anything happening at the project that should we be aware of any changes to the timeline schedule, mm -hmm. the scope. Yep. What's happened in the last week? You know, what, you know, what else have What's I missed next week? Yeah. 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 Yep. And, and that way, as an owner, you feel very um, uh, informed as to what's going on. But also as a contractor, you have the decision making from the owner to keep moving on. Right. Correct. So it kind of works both ways where, you know, and your architect might attend that meeting as well and be able to respond to any ch changes in the plans that may, may need to be made. Um, and there will be changes, you know, there, there there's never been a project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's never been a project without changes. Um, that's correct. Um, yeah, you, made a good so, point. you said RFI in there and I, I said it as well, I think, but an RFI is a request for information and that may come from the contractor that may come from the architect, it may come from your civil engineer. And it's as they're going through the project, um, and they identify, um, you know, something that doesn't line up or there's an undefined scope of work. And you say, well, the owner needs to understand what those RFIs are. Well, what what's an example of that? Well, maybe it's something as simple as paint colors in the office. They weren't identified on the, the project. And we need to execute this contract for the painter and get them in there to paint the office so we can get C of O. If we don't have that OAC meeting, we may submit that RFI and it sits in the owner's inbox for weeks or whatever. And now we're saying, oh, you know, we need to get this paint color selected. We need to get this paint color selected. Well, I sent the RFI, but never got a response. Now, little things like that can delay the project. That's kind of a simple, um, a simple one. But if the owner's on those OACs on a weekly basis, we can bring up that RFI log and say, oh, we've got a, an RFI submitted um, for the paint colors in the office. And the owner goes, oh, I totally missed that. Uh, let's just go with this color blue, those are our standard colors, and that's what I want. Yep. No, that's now, a really you, you yeah. solve that problem. You have no more delays or no delays at all. Execute the contract with your painter and your your off the roll. Yeah, and the the other thing, you know, maybe one one more thing I want to get in here is, um, yeah. you know, Aaron Aaron is involved, but Aaron is the president of the of the organization, and I think when you're evaluating a contractor, Aaron has a team, a very big team, right? And so he's got you may be interacting with Aaron when you're going through the contractor selection and things like that, but Aaron has someone who's doing his estimating, his project management. He's got a field engineer that's going to be in the job shack trailer. He's got project uh, executives on the on the on the uh, the thing. So you know, if you're talking to the guy who's also going to be on site um, every single day, you probably don't have enough layers of project support in there to actually execute a project. And I've had this experience. And so please yeah. don't do that. You know, make sure that 
you're paying for uh, what's called general conditions. Um, you know, maybe we just maybe we just wrap up with that. Um, you know, where where you know if you if you're expecting the contractor to to properly staff and manage the project, you should expect to pay general conditions. Aaron, what are what are general conditions? Yeah, so just like you said, general conditions are the site supervision. So it's the labor for that superintendent to be on site there. It's the cost of your job shack trailer. It's the cost of your temp fencing um, and your cell phones and office supplies and all those things that go into managing that. It's a business. Basically, you're running a business while you're building that facility out on site there. And I think some of the challenge that we get and some of the pushback that we get is, oh, well, these are all the costs for all the subcontractors. Why am I paying this much money for general conditions? I don't, I don't, there's nothing tangible that comes out of that. You know, when I execute a contract for an electrician, I can see the lights and everything that they're putting in and their crew on site. Well, there's a team that needs to manage that project and coordinate all those, those subcontractors. And all those costs are, costs are housed in general conditions. It includes our, our insurance is in there as well, you know, and all the costs that it takes to, to manage that job. You make a good point. You know, if you're talking to the same person that's, that's going to run the job, that's selling you the job, when they get towards the end of that job, they're going to be out trying to sell the next one and they're not going to be managing your job. So yeah, trust me. <laughs> I, I know the experience of, of investing in a, I, I invested passively in a ground up construction of storage and the guy who was raising the money, who was also the guy who was the contractor, who was also the project manager, who was also the superintendent and who was also the worker bee when I showed up to the project, right? That project took five years to build when it should have taken like nine months to build. Yeah. So again, <laughs> He was saving a lot of money, but he was just <laughs> adding years to the project. Yeah. <laughs> so at the some point, value of your money is worth much more than that. Yeah. I mean, what we do yeah. is we kind of look at it and say, when this facility is full, right, 90%, 85% occupied, um, what would the revenue be per day? Right. So, like this Bellevue, this Bellevue project, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, so I apologize. But let's just say it was a $800,000 a year, um, you know, net income property when it was, when it was fully leased up, let's just do the quick math here. 800,000 divided by 365, that's $2,191 a day, a day, a day, right? So every day counts. And so when you're, when you're making a, a business decision, it's like, you know, oh, Hey, let's, you know, let's delay the project, you know, five weeks to get, you know, better cost on light bulbs to save a thousand dollars. <laughs> probably not a good idea when you're losing $2,100 a day in revenue um, when you when you have a project. And, and some projects will actually, we don't do this very typically, but um, you know some projects will have uh, liquidated damages, right? So if the contractor delays a project for a really long time, that's going to cost a, a, a cost to the owner. And, and delays might be like, you know, they can't get enough guys out there or things like that. M m maybe it might not be on the supplier uh, side, but but Aaron, um, you know, you build for other uh, shops as well. So if, if you're listening to the show and you're wondering, man, I, I've got a parcel that I want Aaron to build or want to talk to Spartan Construction Management about, um, Aaron does that for, uh, for, for others. And he also does it, you know, he does build all the Spartan projects. Um, how do people get a hold of you if they want to kind of learn more about what uh, SCM does and, and maybe get a bid from you? Yeah, yeah, you can check us out. Our website is spartanbuilt.com. Or you can email me at Aaron, that's A-A-R-O-N, at SpartanBuilt.com. Well, thanks so much, Aaron, for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, thanks to our listeners for continuing to support the show. As always, go in and like and, uh, like and subscri subscribe, leave us a nice review, and we'll catch you on the next episode. All right, have a great day. Mm -hmm.